വെൽക്കം ടു എ ടി സി എം ദ എമർജൻസി മെഡിസിൻ ചാനൽ ടുഡേ വി ആർ ഗോയിങ് ടു ഡിസ്കസ് ദ എയർവേ അസസ്മെന്റ് ആൻഡ് ദ ഡിഫറെന്റ് എയർവേ അൽഗോറിതംസ് ഇൻക്ലൂഡിംഗ് ദ ക്രാഷ് ഡിഫിക്കൽട്ട് ആൻഡ് ഫെയിൽഡ് എയർവേ അൽഗോറിതം കമ്മിങ് ടു എയർവേ എയർവേ ഇസ് ദ കോണർ സ്റ്റോൺ ഓഫ് റീസർച്ച് സ്റ്റേഷൻ എ ഡിസിഷൻ ടു ഇൻഡിബേറ്റ് ഇസ് ബേസ്ഡ് ഓൺ ദ ഫെയിലിയർ ടു മെയിൻറ്റെയിൻ and protect the airway and also the failure to oxygenate or ventilate and the patient's anticipated clinical course and likelihood of deterioration it is of paramount importance to know what to do if you are not able to intubate the patient than how to intubate the patient coming to airway assessment the first and important point is to assess the airway history in countries like uk the patients if they are having a prior history of difficult intubation it is documented in the health records we need to ask the patient if the patient is having any difficult intubation in the past any reported problems with anesthesia in the past and every effort should be made to obtain and review prior anesthesia records for details of airway management come to the risk factors in assessing a difficult airway one is obstructive sleep apnea and history of snoring obesity facial and neck deformities from previous surgeries head and neck radiations head and neck traumas congenital abnormalities of the head and neck rheumatoid arthritis cervical spine diseases and previous cervical spine injury down syndrome scleroderma in these factors the facial and neck deformities neck radiation trauma these will distort the anatomy so making it a difficult airway and in conditions like rheumatoid arthritis cervical spine diseases ankylosing spondylitis the neck movements are very much restricted so that will make the airway more difficult to get patent some of the specific test that can be used for airway assessment the first and foremost test that we use is the malampathy scores then comes the thyromedial distance the sternomedial distance and the neck circumference and other scoring systems in thyromedial distance we keep the patient's head in maximum extension and we will measure the thyromedial distance and if it is less than 7 cm that will point towards a high risk airway similarly the head is kept in maximum extension and we will measure the sternomedial distance if the sternomedial distance is less than 12.5 cm that two points towards a high risk air similarly if there is increased neck circumference that is more than 17 inches in men and more than 16 inches in women and other tests we use are the upper lip bite test that is the inability to protrude the mandible or the lower teeth in front of the upper teeth there is a laryngoscopic view that is used in the brain that is called the corman lehane in which the grade 3 and grade 4 point towards high risk airways coming to the malambadi score this is the most common scoring system that we use and the most specific uh, test that is used in airway assessment malambadi scoring system we will divide into basically four classes in class 1 we are able to see the entire tonsillar pillars the uvula the heart and soft palate whereas in class 2 we are able to make out only the partial uvula and the soft palate in class 3 only the soft palate is visualized and in class 4 no visualization of any structures beyond the tongue can be made out 
So these are the four classes of the Malambadi scoring. When class one, we are able to see the entire tonsillar pillars, uvula, and soft palate. In class two, we are all only able to make out the partial uvula and soft palate. In class three, only the soft palate, and class four, no visualization of any structures beyond the time. Now we come to identification of difficult laryngeal direct laryngoscopy. There is a mnemonic called the lemon criteria that tells us about identifying a difficult direct laryngoscopy. In lemon criteria, the L stands for look externally. That is, in cases of severe trauma, there will be distorted anatomy that will make it more difficult to visualize the airway. We can evaluate this by the 332 rule in which initially we will ask three fingers at the floor of the mandible and initially we will place three fingers between the incisors and assess the airway and obtaining a glottic view. Second, we will measure the tip of the mentum to the hyoid bone. If you are able to place three fingers starting from the tip of the mentum to the hyoid bone, then we can make sure that the tongue can be deflected to accommodate the laryngoscope. And finally, we will measure the thyromental distance, which has to be approximately two fingers. This will predict the location of larynx to the base of the tongue. If the larynx is high, this makes the angle difficult. So, in assessment of difficult intubation, we can evaluate by the 332 rule technique, where E stands for evaluation. And M stands for the Malambadi score, as we discussed earlier. O stands for obstruction and obesity, which can be caused by various conditions like the Ludwig's angina, the head and neck carcinoma. Then N stands for neck mobility. That is, in the case of ankylosing spondylitis and rheumatoid arthritis, where the movements of the neck are restricted. So, identification of difficult direct laryngoscopy, we use the lemon criteria L4 look externally, E4 evaluate by the 332 rule, and M4 Balnabadi score, O4 obstruction, and N4 neck mobility. Second is identifying a difficult back and mask ventilation. This too, we apply a mnemonic called the MONS criteria, where M stands for the mask seal, O stands for obstruction or obesity, A stands for age more than 55 years, N stands for no teeth, and S stands for stiffness or resistance to ventilation that is seen in COPD or pulmonary edema. Next, we come to a difficult extra glottic device placement. In this, we use the Rhodes criteria, where R stands for restricted mouth opening, O stands for obstructive or obesity, D stands for the distorted anatomy as we described earlier, and S stands for the stiffness to ventilation that is seen in COPD and pulmonary edema patient. Now we come to the difficult airway algorithms. So we have discussed initially airway assessment. That is the cornerstone of resuscitation. We will take the history, then we come to specific risk factors, then we come to specific tests, then we come to the certain mnemonics that are related in anticipating a difficult airway. Now we come to the first of the airway algorithm, that is crash airway algorithm. First, we need to understand what is a crash airway. A crash airway is a state of cardiopulmonary arrest or a state of near arrest and is predicted to be unresponsive 
to direct laryngoscopy. We come to the main emergency algorithm. Initially, we can see if the patient needs intubation, you need to assess the response of the patient. If the patient is unresponsive or is near death, then the patient comes under the crash airway. What if the patient is responsive, if the patient is conscious and oriented, we got enough time to assess and we have to predict a difficult airway. If the patient is having a difficult airway, if we are able to predict a difficult airway, the patient comes under the difficult airway algorithm. If there is no difficult airway, then we will go ahead with the rapid sequence intubation. So basically, first, we need to decide whether the patient needs intubation or not. If the patient needs intubation, then we need to assess the GCS, the consciousness and orientation of the patient. If the patient is unresponsive, if the patient is nearing death, then the patient straight away goes to the crash airway algorithm. If not, we will assess the airway assessment. That is, we are anticipating a difficult airway or not. If we are able to predict a difficult airway, then the patient goes into the difficult airway algorithm. And if not, the patient comes into the rapid sequence intubation. So this is the main emergency algorithm. Now we come to the difficult airway algorithm. The judgment regarding whether to treat the airway as a typical emergency airway or whether to use the difficult airway algorithm is based on the degree of difficulty, the operator experience, the airway management, the devices available and the individual circumstances of the case. Although this is not a crash emergency situation, the operator is forced to act. That is, there is a need to act immediately to intubate before orotracheal intubation quickly becomes impossible. Therefore, in the difficult airway algorithm, the first determination is whether the operator is forced to act. If so, rapid sequence intubation drugs are given and a best attempt at laryngoscopy is undertaken. And if intubation is not successful, the airway is considered fail and the operator moves directly to the fail airway algorithm. Whereas if the patient, if the operator is not forced to act, then you will maintain oxygenation of the patient. If you are not able to maintain oxygenation of the patient, that is failure to maintain oxygenation, you will again go into the failed airway algorithm. Whereas if you are able to maintain oxygenation, you can attempt extraglottic device placement or bag and mask ventilation. If bag and mask ventilation or extraglottic device predicted to be successful, then if the intubation is predicted to be successful, then still you can go rapid sequence intubation with double setup. Whereas it is predicted to be unsuccessful, then you can try the awake technique. If the awake technique is successful, then you will go into post intubation management or rapid sequence intubation. If still the awake technique is not successful, you can plan regarding flexible endoscopy video laryngoscopy and cricothyrotome. So this is the difficult airway algorithm. Thank you. Now let's discuss the crash airway algorithm. Crash airway algorithm is done if the patient is going into unresponsive or near death and the patient requires intubation. In this algorithm, we will maintain oxygenation in the patient and we will attempt intubation. If the intubation is successful, then we will go ahead with the post intubation management. Whereas if the intubation is not successful, then we will go ahead with 
back and mask ventilation. If we are unable to back and ventilate the patient, then we will directly go into the failed airway algorithm. Whereas we are able to back and mask ventilate the patient, then we will give a paralytic agent, succinylcholine 2 mg per kg, and we will attempt a second intubation. And if it is successful, then you will go into the post intubation management. And still, if it is failed, and we have failed to maintain oxygenation, then you will go into failed airway. And we are able to maintain oxygenation in the patient. The last attempt we will go with an experienced doctor and still is not able to maintain oxygenation, will go into failed airway. Whereas if you are able to intubate, you will go into post intubation management. So in crash intubation is done in patients who requires intubation and who is unresponsive or nearing them. First, we will oxygenate the patient. Then you will do first attempt of intubation. If you are able to do, you will directly go into post-intubation management. If not, you will go ahead with the back and mask ventilation. If you are able to do back and mask ventilation, then you will give a paralytic agent and attempt intubation again. Whereas, if you are unable to do maintain a back and mask ventilation, then you will directly go into the failed airway. If you are able to do, you will attempt intubation and if it is still successful, then you will go into the post intubation management. And if you are not able to attempt intubation, if the intubation is unsuccessful for the second time, then you will try to maintain a proper oxygenation in the patient. If you are able to maintain a proper oxygenation in the patient, you will attempt one last time. And if you are able to maintain properly intubate the patient, again you will go into the post intubation management. Whereas if your maximum attempts are three by experienced operator and still you are not able to intubate the patient, you will go into the failed airway. Now we come to the DAS difficult intubation guidelines. In this DAS difficult intubation guidelines, our initial plan A is to give face mask ventilation and attempt the tracheal intubation. So we will do the laryngoscopy and we will attempt the intubation. If it is success, then you will go into the post intubation management. But if you are anticipating a failed intubation, the next plan B is to maintain oxygenation and insert a supraglottic airway device. So if you are able to maintain oxygenation and insert a supraglottic airway device, then it is well and good. And if not, that is a failed supraglottic airway ventilation, then you come to plan C. In plan C, you will do the face mask ventilation. And if you are able to properly ventilate the patient, then it is applied till the patient wakes up. And if you're not able to give an adequate face mask ventilation, then your last resort is plan D, that is a can intubate, can oxygenate situation where you go ahead with the cricothyroidotomy. So in difficult intubation guidelines, the plan A is to ventilate the patient and attempt the tracheal intubation. And if it fails, you go into the plan B where you maintain oxygenation and go ahead with supraglottic airway device insertion. Still it fails, you will give face mark ventilation till the patient wakes up. And the last resort, that is a can't intubate, can't oxygenate situation, you will go ahead with the cricothyroidotom. Thank you.